complete. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer from Perth. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Cooler. I work for the regulator of the Victorian legal profession. So what am I doing here? Shouldn't I just be up in an ivory tower enforcing rules and wagging my finger at people? No. I'm here to learn, because I need your help. Uh, what I want you to help me do is figure out a way to put our office out of business. No more complaints. Now that's a bit ambitious. So I'm a bit of a uh, tragic in uh, legal regulation. I've been in the field for about 25 years, worked for uh, regulators in New South Wales and Victoria. My last role, I was in the front end of the um, complaints handling area. And in the course of nine years, I read about 14 or 15,000 complaints. So I'm an expert in what ticks off Victorian clients. And it really was just the tip of the iceberg. Let me tell you about the sort of complaints that we got in. So 14 or 15,000, that was uh, between uh, one and a half and 2,000 complaints a year. The vast majority of them were not serious disciplinary issues. In fact, only about, uh, probably less than 10% went to be uh, investigated for ethical breaches or disciplinary problems. The vast majority were service issues. So 35% of them were formal costs complaints. About 70 or 80% of them we called consumer matters. 25% of them were about family law. And they were always the same, year after year. The breakup was always the same. So let me give you a bit of an example. Uh, there's a woman I'll call uh, Julie. So Julie was in a, a marriage where she was uh, married to a man who was very controlling and quite abusive towards her. She wanted to get more uh, time with her children. So the ex-husband had the children, she had mental health problems, she wanted to get more time with her children. She went to see a lawyer and by the time she came to us she'd been in the system for two years and she had a bill of nearly $40,000 and she was no further advanced. And the sorts of things she said to us were basically, what was I paying for? I felt like the lawyer was just taking advantage of my mental health and my bad situation. I feel exploited. And when we got the lawyer's side of the story, he really did try and do his best with the equipment that he had, you know, the, the intellectual equipment, the service model that he had, the situation that it was. But the underlying message that came through was that Julie didn't trust her lawyer. They never had a conversation about what she was actually buying when she got the legal service. And the lawyer didn't actually, he wasn't actually able to articulate to her what he was selling to her. So anyway, it comes to us and we have uh, a number of parameters by which we assess these cost disputes. So one of the things that we look at is uh, whether cost disclosure was given. So cost disclosure is a requirement where lawyers have to give a single figure estimate of how much the matter is going to cost. It's an estimate of how much the matter is going to cost. What does that presume? If you're giving an estimate of how much it's going to cost, what is it presuming? It's Sorry? It's not what it is. It's not what it is. It's, it's going to change. And uh, another thing that we might think about is uh, if it has to be... Um, so we'll, we'll try and sort that out by um, alternative dispute resolution means. But if we don't do that, then we, we need to make a determination of some sort as to what are fair and reasonable costs. So what's the problem there? A third party determining what are fair and reasonable costs? Is that possible? It presumes that there's a right answer. It presumes that there is a magic formula by which we can reach a figure that is fair and reasonable. And that's really problematic. So you see a lot of the regulation is really presumed around problems to do with the hourly rate. And because of that, it actually embeds the problem even further. So as a regulator, we don't want to be up there enforcing irrelevant rules that don't work. We want to be looking for harms, real harms to clients. And we want to be thinking about ways in which we can mitigate those harms 
and in which things, it, it, a, a way in which those harms can be prevented. So the two things I would want to ask you are this. What needs to change in the culture of lawyers in order to enable Julie's complaint to be a thing of the past? And what needs to change for us as a regulator if we're going to encourage that kind of cultural change? Thank you. Thank you.